So hello and welcome back to this month, question mark. I don't remember if I did one last month, but if I didn't, then hopefully I'll remember to do these once a month. But we're going to read a short story today. And this one is kind of special because I was looking around and I was trying to think of what I wanted to read. And this is actually a story I've wanted to read for a long time, but I didn't think I had it. Like, I, I legitimately did not think I personally had it in my library, but I was digging around through some of the books that were in the cabin when I got it. Um, so this this book could be from my mom, or it could be from my grandma because that's how long the place I'm living has been in our family. Um, and I, I was just looking through it, and I was like, well, it says short stories. I wonder what it's got in it. So I opened it up, and I was looking through the short stories, and then I got super excited because this story was in it. And a little bit about this book. This is a textbook like a school textbook from 1961. <laughs> so this book is older than me, and the short story that we're going to read is even older than that. And let me see if I can find it really quick here so I can get a when it was written type thing. Or maybe it says it when I get to it. Nope, it doesn't. All right. There we go. Me being, like, absolutely not with it. I know it's an old story, and I know I'm not going to be anywhere near as good as the, um, the movie adaptation that I remember from my childhood of it. But we are going to read, it looks like it was first published in 1907, and we're going to read Ricky Ticky Tabby by Runyard Kipling. I've actually read a couple other things by Kipling. Um, I'm not as well versed on the classics as I would like to be, but I'm pretty sure that Kipling also wrote The White Seal, which is another one that I absolutely love. And I remember the the cartoon version of it from my childhood, and oh, I would love to sit and watch Ricky Ticky Tavi and the White Seal again, because they were excellent cartoons, and uh, maybe I'll see if they're on YouTube. If they're not on YouTube, maybe I'll just dig around and see if I can find them, because they're both wonderful, and I don't remember who did the narration in the cartoon, but whoever it was, I'm not going to be anywhere near as good as them. But Ricky Ticky Tabby is an amazing story, and we're going to read it together. This is the story of the Great War that Ricky Ticky Tabby fought single handed through the bathrooms of the Big Bungalow in Segoli Cantonment. Darcy, the tailor bird, helped him. And Chuchandra, the muskrat, who never comes out into the middle of the floor, but always creeps round by the wall, gave him advice. But Ricky Ticky did the real fighting. He was a mongoose, rather like a little cat in his fur and his tail, but quite like a weasel in his head and his habits. His eyes and the end of his restless nose were pink, he could scratch himself anywhere he pleased, with any leg, front or back, that he chose to use. He could fluff up his tail till it looked like a bottle brush, and his war cry as he scuttled through the long grass was, Rick, tick, 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 tick. One day, a high summer flood washed him out of the burrow where he lived with his father and mother, and carried him kicking and clucking down a roadside ditch. He found a little wisp of grass floating there and clung to it till he lost his senses. When he revived, he was lying in the hot sun in the middle of a garden path, very draggled indeed, and a small boy was saying, 
Here's a dead mongoose. Let's have a funeral. No, said his mother. Let's take him in and dry him. Perhaps he isn't really dead. They took him into the house, and a big man picked him up between his finger and thumb and said that he was not dead, but half choked. So they wrapped him in cotton wool and warmed him, and he opened his eyes and sneezed. Now, said the big man, he was an Englishman who had just moved into the bungalow. Don't frighten him, and we'll see what he'll do. It is the hardest thing in the world to frighten a mongoose, because he is eaten up from nose to tail with curiosity. The motto of all the mongoose family is, run and find out. And Ricky Ticky was a true mongoose. He looked at the cotton wool, decided that it was not good to eat, ran all around the table, sat up and put his fur in order, scratched himself and jumped onto the small boy's shoulder. Don't be frightened, Teddy, said his father. That's his way of making friends. Ow! He's tickling under my chin, said Teddy. Ricky Ticky looked down between the boy's collar and neck, snuffed at his ear and climbed down to the floor where he sat rubbing his nose. Good gracious, said Teddy's mother, and that's a wild creature. I suppose that he's so tame because we've been kind to him. All mongooses are like that, said her husband. If Teddy doesn't pick him up by the tail or try to put him in a cage, he'll run in and out of the house all day long. Let's give him something to eat. They gave him a little piece of raw meat. Ricky Ticky liked it immensely. And when he was finished, he went out into the veranda and sat in the sunshine and fluffed up his fur to make it dry to the roots. And then he felt better. There are more things to find out about in this house, he said to himself, than all my family could find out in all their lives. I shall certainly stay and find out. He spent all day roaming over the house. He nearly drowned himself in the bathtubs, put his nose into the ink on a writing table, and then burned it on one end of the big man's cigar, for he climbed up in the big man's lap to see how writing was done. At nightfall, he ran into Teddy's nursery to watch how kerosene lamps were lighted, and when Teddy went to bed, Ricky Ticky climbed up too, but he was a restless companion because he had to get up and attend to every noise through all the night and find out what made it. Teddy's mother and father came in last thing to look at their boy, and Ricky Ticky was awake on the pillow. I don't like that, said Teddy's mother. He may bite the child. He'll do no such thing, said the father. Teddy is safer with that little beast than if he had a bloodhound to watch him. If a snake came into the nursery now. But Teddy's mother would not think of anything so awful. Early in the morning, Ricky Ticky came to early breakfast in the veranda, riding on Teddy's shoulder, and they gave him banana and some boiled egg, and he sat on all their laps one after the other because... Every well-brought-up mongoose always hopes to be a house mongoose someday and to have rooms to run about in. And Ricky Ticky's mother, she used to live in the general's house at Segoli, had carefully told Ricky what to do if he ever came across men. Then Ricky Ticky went out into the garden to see what was to be seen. It was a large garden, only half cultivated, with bushes as big as the summer houses of, of Marshall Neal roses, lime, orange trees, clumps of bamboos, and thickets of high grass. Ricky Ticky licked his lips. This is a splendid hunting ground, he said, and his tail grew bottle brushy at the thought of it, and he scuttled up and down the garden, scuffling here and there until he heard a very sorrowful voice in a thorn bush. It was Darzy, the tailor bird and his wife. 
They had made a beautiful nest by pulling two big leaves together and stitching them up along the edges with fibers, and they had filled the hollow with cotton and downy fluff. The nest swayed to and fro as they sat on the rim and cried. What's the matter? said Ricky Ticky. We are very miserable, said Darcy. One of our babies fell out of the nest yesterday, and Nog ate him. Hmm, said Ricky Ticky. That is very sad, but I'm a stranger here. Who is Nog? Darcy and his wife only cowered down in the nest without answering, for far from the thick grass at the foot of the bush there came a low hiss, a horrid cold sound that made Ricky Ticky jump back two clear feet. Then inch by inch out of the grass rose the head and the spread hood of Nog, the big black cobra, and he was five feet long from tongue to tail. When he had lifted one-third of himself clear of the ground, he stayed, balancing to and fro, exactly as a dandelion tuft balances in the wind, and he looked at Ricky Ticky with the wicked snake eyes that never change their expression, whatever they may be thinking. Who is Nog? he said. I am Nog. The great god Brahm put his mark upon all our people when the first cobra spread his hood to keep the sun off Brahm as he slept. Look and be afraid. He spread out his hood more than ever, and Ricky Ticky saw the spectacle mark on the back that looks exactly like the eye part of a hook and eye fastening. He was afraid for a minute, but it is impossible for a mongoose to stay frightened for any length of time, and though Ricky Ticky had never met a live cobra before, his mother had fed him on dead ones, and he knew that all a grown mongoose's business in life was to fight and eat snakes. Nog knew that too, and at the bottom of his cold heart, he was afraid said Ricky Ticky, and his tail began to fluff up again. Marks or no marks, do you think it is right for you to eat fledglings right out of a nest? Nog was thinking to himself and watching the least little movement in the grass behind Ricky Ticky. He knew that mongooses in the garden meant death sooner or later for him and his family but he wanted to get Ricky Ticky off guard, so he dropped his head a little and put it to one side. Let us talk, he said. You eat eggs. Why should I not eat birds? Behind you! Look behind you! sang Darcy. Ricky Ticky knew better than to waste time in staring. He jumped up in the air as high as he could go, and just under him, whizzed by the head of Nagina, Nog's wicked wife. She had crept up behind him as he was talking to make an end of him, and he heard her savage hiss as the stroke missed. He came down almost across her back, and if he had been an old mongoose, he would have known that that was the time to break her back with one bite. But he was afraid of the terrible, lashing, return stroke of the cobra, he bit indeed, but he did not bite long enough, and he jumped clear of the whisking tail, leaving Nagina torn and angry. Wicked, wicked Darzi, said Nog, lashing up as high as he could reach towards the nest in the thorn bush, but Darzi had rebuilt it out of reach of snakes, and it just swayed to and fro. Ricky Ticky felt his eyes growing red and hot. When a mongoose's eyes grow red, he is angry. And he sat back on his tail and hind legs like a little kangaroo, and he looked all around him, and he chattered with rage. But Nag and Nagina had disappeared into the grass. 
When a snake misses its stroke, it never says anything or gives any sign of what it means to do next. Ricky Ticky did not care to follow them, for he did not feel sure that he could manage two snakes at once. So he trotted off to the gravel path near the house and he sat down to think. It was a serious matter for him. If you read the old books of natural history, you will find they say that when a mongoose fights the snake and happens to get bitten, he runs off and eats some herb that cures him. That is not true. The victory is only a matter of quickness of eye and quickness of foot. Snakes blow against mongooses jump, and as no eye can follow the motion of a snake's head when it strikes, that makes things much more wonderful than any magic herb. Ricky Ticky knew that he was a young mongoose, and it made him all the more pleased to think that he had managed to escape a blow from behind. It gave him confidence in himself, and when Teddy came running down the path, Ricky Ticky was ready to be petted. But just as Teddy was stooping, something flinched a little in the dust, and a tiny voice said, Be careful. I am death. It was Carrot, the dusty brown snakeling that lies for a chance in the dusty earth, and its bite is as dangerous as a cobra. But he is so small that no one thinks of him, and so he does more harm to people. Ricky Ticky's eyes grew red again, and he danced up to Carrot with a particular rocking, swaying motion that he had inherited from his family. It looks very funny, but it is so perfectly balanced a gait that you can fly off from it at any angle you please, and in dealing with snakes, this is an advantage. If Ricky Ticky had only known he was actually doing a more dangerous thing than fighting Nog, for Karit is so small and can turn so quickly that unless Ricky bit him close to the back of the head, he would get the return stroke in his eye or lip. But Ricky did not know. His eyes were all red and he rocked back and forth, looking for a good place to hold. Karit struck out and Ricky jumped sideways and tried to run in, but the wicked little dusty gray head lashed within a fraction of his shoulder and he had to jump over the body and the head followed his heels. Teddy shouted to the house, Oh, look here! Our mongoose is killing a snake! And Ricky Ticky heard a scream from Teddy's mother. His father ran out with a stick, but by the time he came up, Karit had lunged out once too far and Ricky Ticky had sprung, jumped on the snake's back, dropped his head far beyond his four legs, legs, bitten as high up the back of the snake as he could get a hold, and rolled away. That bite paralyzed Karit, and Ricky Ticky was just going to eat him up from the tail, after the custom of his family at dinner, when he remembered that a full meal makes a slow mongoose. And if he wanted all of his strength and quickness ready, he had to keep himself thin. So he went away for a dust bath under the castor oil bushes while Teddy's father beat the dead Karit. What is the use of that? thought Ricky Ticky. I've settled it all. And then Teddy's mother picked him up away from the dust and hugged him crying that he had saved Teddy from death, and Teddy's father said that he was a providence, and Teddy looked with big, scared eyes. Ricky Ticky was rather amused at all the fuss, which, of course, he did not understand. Teddy's mother might as well have petted Teddy for playing in the dust, but Ricky was thoroughly enjoying himself. That night at dinner, walking to and fro among the wine glasses on the table, he could have stuffed himself three times over with nice things. But he remembered Nog and Nagina. And though it was very pleasant to be patted and petted by Teddy's mother and to sit on Teddy's shoulder, his eyes would grow red from time to time. And he would go off into his long war cry of Rick, tick, 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 tick. 
Teddy carried him off to bed and insisted on Ricky Ticky sleeping under his chin. Ricky Ticky was too well bred to bite or scratch, but as soon as Teddy fell asleep, he went off for his nightly walk around the house, and in the dark, he ran up against Chuchandra, the muskrat, creeping round by the wall. Chuchandra is a broken hearted little beast. He whimpers and creeps all the night, trying to make up his mind to run into the middle of the room, but he never gets there. D Don't kill me, said Chuchandra, almost weeping. Ricky Ticky, don't kill me. Do you think that a snake killer kills muskrats? Ricky Ticky said. Those who kill snakes get killed by snakes, said Chuchandra more sourfully than ever. And how am I to be sure that Nag won't mistake me for you some dark night? There's not the least danger, said Ricky Ticky. But Nag is in the garden, and I know that you don't go there. My cousin Chuna the rat told me, said Chuchandra, and then he stopped. Told you what? Huzzah! Nag is everywhere, Ricky Ticky. You should have talked to Chua in the garden. Well, I didn't, and so you must tell me, and quick, Chuchandra, or I'll bite you. Chuchandra sat down and cried till the tears rolled off his whiskers. I am a very poor man, he sobbed. I never had spirit enough to run into the middle of the room. I mustn't tell you anything. Can't you hear, Ricky Ticky? Ricky Ticky listened. The house was as still as still, but he thought that he could catch the faintest scratch scratch in the world. A noise as faint as that of a wasp walking up a window pane. The dry scratch of a snake's scales on brickwork. That is Nagar Nagina, he said to himself, and he is crawling into the bathroom sluice. You're right, Chuchandra. I should have talked to Chua. Ricky stole off to Teddy's bathroom, but there was nothing there. And then he went to Teddy's mother's bathroom. At the bottom of the smooth plaster wall was a brick pulled out to make a sluice for the bath water. And as Ricky Ticky stole in by the masonry curb where the bath is put, he heard Nog and Nagina whispering together outside in the moonlight. When the house is emptied of people, said Nagina to her husband, he will have to go away, and then the garden will be our own again. Go in quietly, and remember the big man who killed Karit is the first one to bite. Then come out and tell me, and we will hunt for Ricky Ticky together. But you are sure that there is anything to be gained by killing the people, said Nog. Everything. When there were no people in the bungalow, did we have a mongoose in the garden? So long as the bungalow is empty, we are king and queen of the garden. And remember that as soon as our eggs in the melon bed hatch, and they may by tomorrow, our children will need room and quiet. I had not thought of that, said Nog. I will go, but there is no need that we should hunt for Ricky Ticky after. I will kill the big man and his wife and the child if I can, and come away quietly. Then the bungalow will be empty, and Ricky Ticky will go. Ricky Ticky tingled all over with rage and hatred at this. And then Nog's head came through the sluice, and his five feet of cold body followed. Angry as he was, Ricky Ticky was very frightened as he saw the size of the big cobra. Nog coiled himself up, raised his head, and looked into the bathroom in the dark, and Ricky could see his eyes glitter. Now, if I kill him here, Nagina will know. And if I fight him in the open floor, the odds are in his favor, so what am I to do, said Ricky Ticky Tabby. 
Nog waved to and fro, and then Ricky Ticky heard him drinking from the biggest water jar that was used to fill the tub. That is good, said the snake. Now when Karitz was killed, the big man had a stick. He may have that stick still, but when he comes in to bathe in the morning, he will not have a stick. I shall wait here till he comes. Nagini, do you hear me? I shall wait here in the cool till day. There was no answer from outside, so Ricky Ticky knew Nagini had gone away. Nag coiled himself down, coil by coil, round the bulge at the bottom of the water jar, and Ricky Ticky stayed still as death. After an hour, he began to move muscle by muscle towards the jar. Nog was asleep, and Ricky Ticky looked at his big back, wondering which would be the best place for a good hold. If I don't break his back on the first jump, said Ricky, he can still fight, and if he fights, oh, Ricky. He looked at the thickness of the neck below the hood, but that was too much for him, and a bite near the tail would only make Nog savage. It must be the head, he said at last the head above the hood, and once I am there, I must not let go. And then he jumped. The head was lying a bit clear of the water jar under the curve of it, and as his teeth met, Ricky braced his back against the bulge of the red earthenware to hold down the head. This gave him one second's purchase, and he made the most of it. Then he was battered to and fro as a rat is shaken by a dog, to and fro on the floor, up and down and round in great circles. But his eyes were red, and he held on as the body cart-whipped all over the floor, upsetting the tin dipper and the soap dish and the flesh brush and banged against the side of the bath. As he held, he closed his jaws tighter and tighter, for he made sure that he would be banged to death, and for the honor of his family, he preferred that to be found with his teeth locked. He was dizzy and aching and felt shaken to pieces when something went off like a thunderclap just behind him, and a hot wind knocked him senseless, and red fire singed his fur. The big man had been wakened by the noise and had fired both barrels of a shotgun in the nog right behind the hood. Ricky Ticky held on with his eyes shut, for now he was quite sure that he was dead. But the head didn't move, and the big man picked him up and said, It is the mongoose again. Alice, the little chap has saved our lives now. And then Teddy's mother came in with a very white face and saw what was left of Nog, and Ricky Ticky dragged himself to Teddy's bedroom and spent half the rest of the night shaking himself tenderly and finding out whether he was really broken in forty pieces as he fancied. When morning came, he was very stiff but well pleased with his doings. Now I have Nagina to settle with and she will be worse than five nogs, and there is no knowing when the eggs that she spoke of will hatch. Goodness, I must go and see Darcy, he said. Without waiting for breakfast, Ricky Ticky ran to the thorn bush, where Darcy was singing a song of triumph at the top of his voice. The news of Nog's death was all over the garden, for the sweeper had thrown the body in the rubbish heap. Oh, you stupid tuft of feathers, Ricky Ticky said. Is this the time to sing? Nog is dead, Nog is dead, sang Darcy. The valiant Ricky Ticky caught him by the head and held him fast. The big man brought the bang stick and Nog fell in two pieces, and he will never eat my babies again. All that is true enough, but where is Nagina? said Ricky Ticky looking around him. Nagina came into the bathroom sluice and called for Nog, said Dursey. And Nog came out in the end of a stick. The sweeper picked him up on the end of a long stick and threw him upon the rubbish heap, 
Let us all sing about the great red-eyed Ricky Ticky. And Darzy filled his throat and sang. If I could get to your nest, I would roll all your babies out, said Ricky Ticky. You don't know when to do the right thing at the right time. You are safe enough in your nest there, but it is war for me down here. Stop singing a minute, Darzy. For the great and beautiful Ricky Ticky's sake, I will stop, said Darzy. What is it, O killer of the terrible dog? Where is Nagina for the third time? On the rubbish heap by the stables mourning for Nog. Great is Ricky with the white teeth. Bother my white teeth. Have you ever heard where she keeps her eggs? In the melon bed, on the end nearest the wall where the sun hits nearly all day. She had them there three weeks ago. And you never thought it was worthwhile to tell me. The end nearest the wall, you said. Ricky Ticky, you are not going to eat her eggs. Not eat. Not exactly. Darcy, if you have a grain of sense, you will fly off to the stables and pretend that your wing is broken and let Nagina chase you away to this bush. I must get to the melon bed, and if I went there now, she would see me. Darcy was a feather-brained little fellow who could never hold more than one idea at a time in his head, and just because he knew that Nagina's children were born in eggs like his own, he didn't think at first that it was fair to kill them. But his wife was a sensible bird, and she knew that a cobra's eggs meant young cobras later on. So she flew off from the nest and left Darzy to keep the babies warm and to continue his song about the death of Nog. Darzy was very like a man in some ways. She fluttered in front of Nagina by the rubbish heap and cried out, Oh, my wing is broken. The boy in the house threw a stone at me and broke it. Then she fluttered more desperately than ever. Nagina lifted her head and hissed. You warned Ricky Ticky when I would have killed him. Indeed and truly you've chosen a bad place to be lame in. And she moved toward Darcy's wife, slipping over the dust. The boy broke it with a stone, shrieked Darcy's wife. Well, it may be some consolation to you when you are dead to know. I will settle accounts with that boy. My husband lies on the rubbish heap this morning, but before the night, the boy in the house will lie still as well. What is the use of running away? I'm sure to catch you. Little fool, look at me. Darcy's wife. Knew better than to do that, for a bird who looks into a snake's eyes gets so frightened that she cannot move. Darcy's wife fluttered on, piping sourfully and never leaving the ground, and Nagina quickened her pace. Ricky Ticky heard them going up the path from the stables, and he raced for the end of the melon patch near the wall. There, in the warm litter around the melons, very cunningly hidden, he found twenty-five eggs, about the size of a bantam's eggs, but with a whitish skin instead of a shell. I was not a day too soon, he said, for he could see the baby cobras curled inside the skin, and he knew the minute they were hatched they could each kill a man or a mongoose. He bit off the tops of the eggs as fast as he could, taking care to crush the young cobras, and he turned over the litter from time to time to see if he had missed any. At last, there were only three eggs left, and Ricky Ticky began to chuckle to himself when he heard Darcy's wife scream, Ricky Ticky, I led Nagina toward the house, and she has gone onto the veranda. Come quickly, she means killing. Ricky Ticky smashed two eggs, and tumbled backwards down the melon bed with the third egg in his mouth, and he scuttled to the veranda as hard as he could put foot to ground. Teddy and his mother and father were there at an early breakfast, but Ricky Ticky saw that they were not eating anything. 
They sat stone still, and their faces were white. Nagina was coiled on the matting by Teddy's chair, within easy striking distance of Teddy's bare leg, and she was swaying to and fro and singing a song of triumph. Son of the big man that killed Nog, she hissed. Stay still. I'm not ready yet. Wait a little. Keep very still, all you three. If you move, I strike. If you do not move, I strike. Oh, foolish people who killed my Nog. Teddy's eyes were fixed on his father, and all his father could do was whisper, Sit still, Teddy. You mustn't move, Teddy. Keep still. Then Ricky Ticky came up and cried, Turn around, Nagina! Turn and fight! All in good time, she said without moving her eyes. I will settle my account with you presently. Look at your friends, Ricky Ticky. They are still and white and they are afraid. They do not dare move, and if you come a step near, I strike. Look at your eggs, said Ricky Ticky. In the melon bed near the wall. Go and look, Nagina. The big snake turned half round and saw the egg on the veranda. Ah! Give it to me, she said. Ricky Ticky put his paws one on either side of the egg, and his eyes were blood red. What price for a snake's egg? For a young cobra. For a young king cobra. For the last, the very last of the brood. The ants are eating all the others down by the melon bed. Nagina spun clear round, forgetting everything for the sake of the one egg, and Ricky Ticky saw Teddy's father shoot out a big hand, catch Teddy by the shoulder, and drag him across the table with the teacups safe and out of reach of Nagini. Nagina. Trick! 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 Rick tick 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 tick! chuckled Ricky Ticky. The boy is safe, and it was I. I that caught Nog by the hood last night in the bathroom. Then he began to jump up and down, all four feet together, his head near the floor. He threw me to and fro, but he could not shake me off. He was dead before the big man blew him in two, and I did it, Rick, tick, 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 tick. Come then, Nagina, come and fight with me. You won't be a widow for long. Nagina saw that she had lost her chance of killing Teddy, and that the egg lay between Ricky Ticky's paws. Give me the egg, Ricky Ticky. Give me the last of my eggs and I'll go away and never come back. She lowered her hood. Yes, you will go away, and you will never come back, for you will go in the rubbish heap with Nog. Fight, widow. The big man has gone for his gun. Fight. Ricky Ticky was bounding all round Nagina, keeping just out of reach of her stroke, his little eyes hot like coals. Nagina gathered herself together and flung out at him. Ricky Ticky jumped up and back. Again and again she struck, and each time her head came within a whack on the matting of the veranda, and Ricky gathered himself, and she gathered like a watch spring, and then Ricky danced in a circle to get behind her. And Nagina spun around to keep her head to his head, so that the rustle of her tail on the matting sounded like dry leaves being blown by the wind. He had forgotten about the egg. It still lay on the veranda, and Nagina came nearer and nearer to it, Till at last, while Ricky Ticky was drawing breath, she caught it in her mouth, turned to the veranda steps, and flew like an arrow down the path with Ricky Ticky behind her. When a cobra runs for her life, she goes like a whiplash flicked across a horse's neck. Ricky Ticky knew that he must catch her, or all the trouble would begin again. She headed straight for the long grass by the thorn bush, and he was running. And as he was running, Ricky Ticky heard Darzee still singing his foolish little song of triumph. 
but Darzee's wife was wiser. She flew off of her nest as, as Nagina came along and flapped her wings around Nagini's head. If Darzi had helped, they might have turned her, but Nagina only lowered her head and went on. Still, the instant delay brought Ricky Ticky up to her, and as she plunged into the rat hole where she and Nog used to live, his little white teeth were clenched on her tail, and he went down with her. And very few mongoose, however way wise and old they may be, care to follow a cobra into its hole. It was dark in the hole, and Ricky Ticky never knew when it might open out and give Nagina the room to turn and strike at him. He held on savagely, and he struck out his feet to act as brakes in the dark slope of the hot, moist earth. Then the grass, by the mouth of the hole, stopped waving, and Darzy said, It is all over with Ricky Ticky! We must sing his death song. Valiant Ricky Ticky is dead, for Nagina will surely kill him underground. So he sang a very mournful song that he made up all on the spur of the minute, and just as he got to the most touching part, the grass quavered again, and Ricky Ticky, covered in dirt, dragged himself out of the hole, leg by leg, licking his whispers. Darzy stopped with a little shout, and Ricky Ticky shook some of the dust out of his fur and sneezed. It is all over, he said. The widow will never come out again. And the red ants that live between the grass stems heard him and began to troop down one after the other to see if he had spoken the truth. Ricky Ticky curled up in the grass and slept where he was slept and slept till it was late afternoon, for he had done a hard day's work. Now, he said when he awoke, I will go back to the house, tell the coppersmith, Darzy, and he will tend the garden that Nagini is dead. The coppersmith is a bird that makes a noise exactly like the beating of a little hammer upon a copper pot, and the reason he is always making it is because he is the town crier in every Indian garden, and he tells all the news to everyone who cares to listen. As Ricky Ticky went up the path, he heard his attention notes like a tiny dinner gong, and then the steady ding dong talk. Nag is dead. Dong. Nagina is dead. Ding dong talk. And that set all the birds in the garden singing and the frogs croaking. For Nag and Nagina used to eat frogs as well as birds. When Ricky got to the house, Ted and Teddy's mother, she was still looking very pale, for she had been fainting, and Teddy's father came out and almost cried over him. And that night he ate all that was given to him till he could eat no more, and he went to bed on Teddy's shoulder, where Teddy's mother saw him when she came to look in late at night. He saved our lives, and Teddy's life, she said to her husband. Just think, he saved all our lives. Ricky Ticky woke up with a jump, for all mongooses are light sleepers. Oh, it's you, he said to them. What are you bothering for? All the cobras are dead, and if they weren't, I'm here. Ricky Ticky had a right to be proud of himself, but he did not grow too proud, and he kept that garden as a mongoose should keep it, with tooth and jump and spring and bite, till never a cobra dared show its head inside the walls. And that is the story of Ricky Ticky Tavi, the brave little mongoose, and I remember when I was in grade school, I don't remember too terribly much about grade school. It was a very long time ago, but I do remember them bringing in the movies. And this is how old I am. Movies, when I was in grade school, were actual film movies on reels. And sometimes they would bring in Ricky Ticky Tavi and set up the projector 
pull down the, the screen at the front of the class and we would watch it and it was always one of my favorites so if you haven't read that one before now you have and if you have i hope i did it at least a little bit of justice i kept messing up and calling her either nagina or nagini it's nagina but other than that thank you so much for listening i hope that you enjoyed this little story and i will see you later <laughs>